after the after the session, and we'll post that on the Iowa OER YouTube channel. So now I will turn it over to Professor Hendricks. Great, thank you so much. Um, you did a wonderful introduction, and I may be able to just skip one of my slides. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So uh, speaking of slides, I've put them into the chat, a link to the slides on Google Docs, because um, there are some notes in a number of them with links to things that you might be interested in, in pursuing later, but I'll also be putting those into the chat as well, uh, if I remember as I go along. So um, please forgive me and let me know if you'd like a link to something that I haven't included. So let me share my screen. Um, and do the slideshow. So I'm assuming you're seeing the slides now. Good. Okay. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So just a quick introduction to me, just to add on. Um, I'm a professor of teaching philosophy, and that role is a, um, a, a tenured a tenured and tenure track role um, uh, in that focuses on teaching as well as educational leadership, whereas we also have uh, tenure track roles in uh, research and teaching. Um, so I've, I've been in this role uh, as a professor of teaching for a number of years, but I've been at UBC since 2004, so going on 20 years now. Currently this year, and just for a few more months, I'm the Vice Purpose Teaching and Learning Pro Tem while someone else is on leave. And previous to that, I was the Academic Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at UBC Vancouver for five years. And as already, has already been mentioned, I've been an open education practitioner, researcher, and advocate for over 10 years. Um, just something that uh, made sense to me when I first learned about it. Um, like, yes, of course, I would be happy to share uh, the things that I'm doing and um, work on things that will help to promote both student affordability as well as um, the ability to revise um, resources to better fit course context. So this, this talk is about um, the uh, Open Textbooks in Philosophy Introduction to Philosophy series. And so I'll just start at the very beginning. Um, and I don't remember exactly when which year it started because it's been a while now. Um, but just recognizing that there were very few open textbooks in philosophy. And this, this would have been at least five years ago, if not uh, more than that. Um, and when when I was thinking about this, I thought, okay, well, I'm not, I can't, I, I don't have the expertise, it was my thought, to write an open textbook to do all of the introduction to philosophy. Um, it would take me a lot to kind of get the expertise in all the various areas that, that might be needed to do that. It's just not something that I focused on uh, over time. I've been quite specialized in what I've taught. So... Um, I actually had a conversation with Hugh McGuire, who uh, uh, heads up press books um, at a, a conference in Vancouver. And this is what I, I can't remember. This picture is from 2017, but I think it was the year before. It might have been 2016 when I uh, had this initial conversation with him. Um, he was presenting at an open textbook summit in, in Vancouver, and he was talking in part about Lib LibriVox, which is a, um, a project to create audio books where it just it crowdsources volunteers to do the reading um, so that that anyone who's willing can uh, sign up to uh, read an audio book and create um, to, to read a book and create an, an audio version. He was also at the time working on um, developing the Rebus Foundation, which is the group that I worked with to uh, start this series of open textbooks. And as he was talking about LibriVox, it just started to click with me. Oh, what if, what if we sort of crowdsourced an open textbook? What if we put out a call and said, we're looking for authors for an open textbook in philosophy. I don't want to write all of them. It, it, it's not something that that I would be great at doing. Um, but lots of people um, have this expertise and and could each do a little bit. And then we'd have, a, we'd have an open textbook. So I had a, an initial conversation with him. Uh, and then I had another conversation with him a year later 
uh, once uh, he had Rebus Foundation sort of more up and running. And uh, we got things started. He said, okay, we'd love to help you with that. And uh, it, uh, I remember this conversation with him. It was like, okay, this could be really big. And it turned out to be even bigger than either one of us thought. So um, it started as an idea for a single open textbook with editors for each of several parts. So there would be ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, logic. Um, I don't remember exactly how many we had at the beginning. I think social and political were in there. We might have had about five where we talked about it being a single book with five or six parts. Um, and to do that, we created a book concept document, which was really, you know, just a general outline of, of what we we thought the, the book should look like, the scope, the audience. We created a role description for the part editor. Um, so we were calling it a part editor at the time. So they would create an outline of their part. They would choose the authors. They would edit the sections of, of that book. And then um, we did some editor recruitment uh, through philosophy email lists and, and otherwise and managed to find editors for the sections uh, that we had developed at the time. But there was a lot of interest, which is not a bad thing. Um, and as, as we were working with the initial editors, um, one of them in particular said, oh, you know what? I think my section could be its own book. I think that there's enough interest out there and I'm wanting to do uh, a full book that, that we could do it um, as a separate book. And I thought, okay, well, let me just bring that to the other editors because you know, that, that kind of throws the, the original idea off a little, um, but everyone was on board. So they all were fine with, with doing separate books. It wasn't a huge difference, except that it meant um, a bit more for each one. When we were talking about a single book, uh, then there would maybe be, you know, three, four chapters in each of the sections, each of the parts. Um, but then when we were talking about a full book uh, for each of the parts, then there would be, you know, eight, nine, 10 uh, chapters, but they were all on board. Um, these were, yeah, these were some of the, the first uh, books that we, we started with logic, ethics, philosophy of mind, philosophy of religion, aesthetics. And now I'm remembering social and political was one of the first ones as well. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, and ultimately, we ended up with a plan for nine uh, separate books. Um, and we've got six published so far. Uh, and I wanted to, sh oh, I'm having a hard time linking while I'm presenting. So, all right, I may just have to share links later um, because if I try to get a link and share it, it'll, it'll um, stop the presentation. But uh, I, I have links to a, a, a web page that has all of the published books and then all of the books that are still um, uh, in development. So right now, there's one book, Metaphysics, which is undergoing peer review. And there's two others in, in development, which is Social and Political. Um, still, it's had a couple of uh, changeovers of editors. And uh, Philosophy of Science uh, is still in development. So how did the books come together? This is where I just kind of talk about the nitty gritty of, of what we did and what we're still doing. Um, and all of this with the help of the Rebus community um, who were really, really hands-on in the beginning as we started to develop the whole project. And then over time, I started taking on more and more of the work, which makes a lot of sense. Um, just needed to get me kind of onboarded. <laughs> Um, and there were many, many volunteers. So we had editors for each book, and then we had like eight, nine, ten authors for each book as well. So it was quite a large, um, quite a large project. So what did we do? Um, publicity about the project and recruitment was a little bit challenging in philosophy in the beginning. Um, there are a lot of philosophy email lists, and that seemed to be the best uh, way to reach out to folks to, to gather interest in, in who might be willing to be an editor or an author. I tried some social media, but um, philosophers are in different places, and, and that just it didn't really yield that much. 
Um, there's also uh, the Rebus community has an email list, so we use that as well. And that was uh, also generated some interest. Communications we worked on through um, the Rebus community forum at first, uh, which again, I'll provide a link to in, in uh, a little bit. Um, uh, it's it's a it's basically an online forum and and at first we were communicating to recruit authors and talk to potential authors and talk to editors and sort of keep everything um, uh, in an open space at first. Um, but then you know over time it just became a little bit more challenging. Sometimes you have to have a little bit more sensitive conversations, you know, about you know, like why people might be interested or not interested, or you know maybe changes to their 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 uh, chapter. And so it started to move more and more into email, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit as as one of the challenges. Um, workflows and guides. We created multiple guides again with the help of the Rebus community, and and some of this made its way into their uh, uh, guideline uh, book called the Rebus Community Guide to Creating Open Textbooks. So far, and um, uh, because we were working with them, they were developing their processes alongside of us and others. We were not the only early project. And um, so they have this wonderful guide now that anyone can access that has excellent uh, recommendations for doing a project, not necessarily this big, but um, a, a project of creating an open textbook. So the guides we created are um, uh, editor uh, role description, an author guide, which talks about things like uh, authors, uh, chapter authors talks about things like the audience we would like you to write for, the length of the chapters, the content of the chapters, copyright considerations and open licensing for images and other media, which was a little bit of a challenge here and there sometimes, um, accessibility considerations and trying to address that right from the beginning when authors were writing, or at least if they didn't fully um, make their their content accessible. I was going in relatively early on and, and setting things up to, to be more so, so we didn't have to do it right at the end. Uh, the license the book will be published with, everyone had to agree to that license. We also had a peer review guide, um, which talked about the approximate timeline for peer review, things to look for in your peer review. So, you know, your, your expertise in philosophy and, and uh, do you think that the interpretations provided are, are accurate? Uh, the, the audience of a first year um, student who's never taken any philosophy before, clarity, trying to think about consistency over the whole book as people read the all chapters um, rather than just one chapter to do a peer review organization and flow and, and inclusivity of, of diverse voices as well. We also had a, a guide for formatting in press books because there was a lot of things that um, uh, in order to import things into press books and have them work out and be consistent across the multiple books, there was a lot of, of uh, things to, to consider there as well as accessibility. Um, shared documents, we worked almost exclusively on Google Docs. Uh, at the time, it was really sort of the best option for um, shared work across people uh, across the world. Um, so we did all the writing. In, well, sometimes people would write in, in Word and upload to Google Docs. All the reviews were, were done in Google Docs, um, all the revisions. And then we imported directly from Google Docs into uh, Pressbooks. And then uh, updates about progress on the Rebus community forum. As I mentioned, we we were sort of doing all of our communications on this open forum. Um, and then things started kind of slowly moving into email. And so then I just now, not as good as I should be, <laughs> provide updates on the forum about, about what's going on and where things are. And, you know, whether we still need volunteers for any of the books, whether we still need chapter authors and that kind of thing. Um, this is the general workflow for how things uh, worked for each book. So the editor would create an outline and then we would do a peer review of that outline. We would reach out to folks through the Rebus community forum or even through the group of editors and authors that we already had and say, you know, anyone who, who has a chance, please provide feedback on this outline of chapters for each book. 
then once the outline was finalized, uh, the editor and I, a series editor, would do recruitment uh, of authors. Um, sometimes the editor took more um, uh, uh, initiative in that. Sometimes I, I did more work in that. It just kind of depends on how people work. Authors did their writing, the editors reviewed. Um, and then I there was a little little spot in here that I didn't include myself, but the editors would review after writing and then I would do the review and then it would go out for peer review and then it would come back to the authors for revisions, the authors and editors for, for revisions. I was reviewing after peer review and, and I found that that wasn't as, as useful. Um, I needed to sort of go in and think about audience and consistency across the books and those kinds of things that uh, I think were just better before peer review. And then once the revised chapters were ready, we went through copy editing and I did a, a final accessibility review that tended to be me, um, though some editors uh, just had more knowledge about this than others and could do it themselves. Formatting in press books. Um, was either me or some, we got a couple of volunteers for some of the books to, to do the importing and formatting and press books. Uh, cover art and design, you'll see on, um, I think it's the next slide, the cover art was done by uh, one of the book editors actually, and she's been doing the artworks for all of the books in the series so far. And we found a volunteer who could work on the design for the covers. And then we published, publicized, and added to uh, various repositories. So that was our general workflow. How things went, how things are going, what's working well and not so well. Yeah, this is one of the covers. Um, and uh, the, the Philosophy of Mind book was the first one to come out. And the editor, Heather Salazar, is the one who did the artwork for all the covers. So that's why I wanted to feature this one um, uh, on the slide. So the successes, lots of volunteers. Um, there was much more interest than I anticipated. I don't know why I didn't anticipate it, but there was a lot of people who were interested in, in helping out with this project, which is why we were able to get it to, you know, a set of nine books rather than just one. Um, so that uh, that included a number of faculty members, but it also included some graduate students, some PhD students. We even had a master's student uh, or two um, who were uh, volunteering as authors uh, or reviewers. We had um, at least one or two undergraduate students who uh, volunteered as peer reviewers or, or reviewers as well, which was fantastic. Um, successes, working with the Rebus community on setting up the processes, the guides, the workflows, um, having someone who, uh, I, I had a couple of different people that I was working with over the years and just having someone to go to, to say, okay, how do I do this thing? Because I am not a project manager. I've never done anything like this before. I've never edited a book, much less a series of books. That was just really critical. And I wanted to mention not only the Rebus Community Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks that, that now exists, but didn't at the time, but also the Rebus um, uh, Textbook Success Program, where people who are interested in doing uh, an open textbook can sign up for, uh, it's a several months of a cohort experience program where they learn um, how to do this sort of thing and, and get advice and, and feedback. So they have they've are offering this sort of thing to others and uh, it does cost money, uh, but uh, their, their support is just incredibly helpful. Um, and then another success is having active, active book editors who are really excited, really want to move things along, keep up with the work. That's been uh, really fantastic because I'm one person and I, you know, with nine books, I, I just can't keep up with everything. <laughs> Some challenges. Um, as I was mentioning, I don't remember exactly when we started because it's been so many years. I think it was 2017 when we first started. Um, so it's been a long time and we're still not done. Publishing one book takes a long time. Publishing nine books is is challenging. And maybe the first bullet and the second bullet on this slide can go together because keeping up momentum over the course of years can be really difficult. And I found 
with my own capacity that all I could do was sort of focus on one or at most two books at a time. And yet we had multiple kind of going. So I had to kind of stagger things um, just given the uh, you know, my role in the process. Um, managing a large process, managing a large project. Like I mentioned, it's not something that I really knew how to do. There were a lot of authors, a lot of editors, a lot of um, moving pieces that were happening at the same time. So we we kept track of things on spreadsheets and you know on the, the community forum. And then in a bunch of emails, I had a little project tracking software that I was using just for myself. But but it was challenging to keep keep going with everything. Um you know when you've got a bunch of different authors keeping some level of coherence across not only a single book, but across multiple books. You're not you're not going to get that entirely, right? Writing styles are going to be different, and the approaches to the chapters are going to be different. And even though we had an author guide um, that tried to have a bit of consistency, um, it was it was a little challenging to to sort of keep that going. So I just after a time just decided, okay, look, each book is going to have its own flavor. They're going to be broadly similar in that they're meant to, to, to do a kind of survey of each topic for students who have no experience in philosophy, but but otherwise it's okay if they're if they're fairly different. Um, diversity inclusion was a challenge. We we did have in the author guide um, a, a focus on diverse voices and perspectives. And um, sometimes I would find by the time I had seen you know, the, the work progressing all the way to the end where it was ready for peer review. Um, the, there wasn't as much as, as I would have hoped to see in terms of diverse voices and perspectives. So sometimes I had to try to address that after the fact, which was a bit challenging and something that uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing more at the beginning now. Um, author guide and style sheet. We had an author guide, but we didn't have a style sheet at the beginning. And this turned out to be really challenging by the time we got to copy editing. We told people, okay, here's the style. We were using Chicago author date style, but that doesn't mean that's actually the style that was used. And and um, there were a number of things that I hadn't really thought of that needed to, to be considered. Um, by the time it got to copy editing, the copy editor was like, oh, what about this, this, and this? And I thought, oh, those are great questions. We don't have answers. So we were kind of building that as we went. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. And yeah, keeping up momentum, I've already mentioned. So just keeping track of time and a, a few more slides uh, and then opening it out for questions and discussion. So lessons learned, um, emphasizing expectations for book editors and authors, including diversity and inclusion, something I just really, um, I don't know, I guess, you know, thinking, well, it's in the author guide, right? But but that's just something that it needs to really be paid attention to um, much more closely. Checking in on progress frequently. As things moved out of the more open Rebus forum space and into emails and sometimes through the book editor, connecting with the author separately, which was fine. I don't need to be copied on every email. Um, I, I kind of lost track over time sometimes about where things were and would check in and, and not as often as I should have checked in perhaps and things sometimes languished a bit. Uh, just, you know, people are busy. This was a volunteer project. Things go... Sometimes they, uh, when they're off the side of your desk, they go um, a little bit, you know, down on the priority list, and that's just the way it is. Um, we didn't provide financial compensation because we didn't have any. And, you know, the more that I think about it, the more, if possible, um, that, that could be helpful. I think it changes um, who's able to participate um, and who's willing to participate. Uh, if you if you say this is just volunteer, the the folks who have the time, you know, the folks who uh, uh, have sort of stable jobs and that kind of thing are going to be more willing uh, to volunteer. So it's not something we had access to, nor do I now. Um, but uh, it's just something that I'm I'm learning as a lesson. 
and then provide an accessible template for the chapters. I didn't do this at first, but I'm doing it. I'm working on it now where just write your chapter in this template. It's already got the headings, right? If you need a table, use this template for a table or something like that, uh, just to make it easier. And explaining to folks, not only the accessibility requirements, which we do sort of not as well as, as I should have, um, but also the rationale, like why, why is this why is this needed and why is it helpful? So these are some things that I would uh, take forward into the future. And then just a little bit about, you know, what's the future of this project? Um, how things might go in the future. Like here are some things on my mind um, as we, you know, think of, we've, we've got the first version of six of the nine books. I mean, the first thing is to finish the nine books. Um, but then, you know, what, how might we improve them over time? Again, more diverse philosophical approaches and voices. Interactive elements, we, we don't have that in our books. They are kind of typical, I don't know, philosophy books and that they're really just text and, and discussion questions. And there's not really, you know, kind of any interactivity quizzing, that kind of thing. And it's just something that the H5P didn't exist when we started, um, but something that that uh, we just haven't included, but would be good. I think it'd be great to have more undergraduate student involvement um, uh, to the degree possible and trying to find some grant funding to support these changes is something I would be thrilled to look into more. And I think, oh yeah, sustainment. Uh, this is a very challenging question for lots of open textbook projects, I think. How to maintain the books over time as people leave the project, retire, et cetera. Um, you know, what happens when I <laughs> retire? Um, and, and people do leave the project. We've had a couple of, of editors turnover. Uh, you know, folks just don't have time. Um, if I wanted to uh, change the books. Um, what if the editors are just not interested in working on it anymore? Maybe I would take over as, as editor and, and do the changes that I'd like and create a new create a new version. Um, anyway, it's just, just sort of that's another question kind of in my mind. Sorry. And then, yeah, just a concluding thought and then opening it up for questions. Um, a concluding thought, as I mentioned at the beginning, I could not have done this all myself. And I think the result is much richer. And um, we've got so many fantastic, amazing people from so many different places participating in this project and, and contributing chapters um, that I think that the books are much better than, than it would have been if I had just written them, written a book. Um, and also there's a, a secondary benefit too, because by having so many people involved, it not only increases the number of OER and philosophy, but may increase awareness and adoption of OER um, with, I haven't counted the number of, of chapter authors and editors, but there's a lot. Uh, and, and you know, the more people involved in the project, the more they're likely to adopt in their courses, the more they may be likely to talk to, to colleagues, et cetera. So, you know, that's a, a bit of a side benefit. And that's my presentation. So on the slide I have, um, my email address, christina.hendricks at ubc.ca. And I'm on Mastodon at hcommons.social at chendricks. And I think I will stop sharing and happy to have a conversation. Well, that was wonderful, Christina. I think you shared... Yeah you know, a lot about kind of your process and your workflow and challenges and, and things that went well. And I think it was provided a lot of information for us as, as people who kind of work in the OER space. And, you know, I think it was just really impressive that you were able to create a series of such quality and of such scope on a purely volunteer basis. Um, you know, that's just kind of mind blowing, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, well, so, I had a lot of help. Yeah. <laughs> Well, volunteer help, nonetheless, which is, <laughs> which is pretty great. Um, so does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Professor Hendricks? And I'm also throwing things into the chat. Um, I've thrown the Rebus forum page for this series. 
I'll also, as part of that, there's a link to the published books in the series. Um, and you folks- They're also in repositories, so. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to find a good link to share. I ended up just linking to um, press books, but I think, yeah, in Rebus, that sort of makes more sense. Um, yeah, but yeah, there, there, the yeah audience... there was a project page that had everything, but they moved away from that. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, please go ahead. Oh, no, no. Um, I was just going to say, if you if people in the audience would feel more comfortable unmuting themselves and just asking their questions verbally, that's fine, too. Um, I did have one question for you. Um, how has the work been received in the philosophy community? Do you know if it's been used in a lot of courses so far? That's a great question. I should have looked at the um, adoption form before this uh, meeting and the sort of stats. Uh, I do get um, emails every time someone fills out the adoption form. And I'm, I don't know, I probably get a couple of months. Um, uh, so I can take a quick look at that if, if people don't mind. Uh, but I don't remember exactly how many there are. So yeah, there def definitely are adoptions in, in the philosophy community. Um, th I'm sure there are more than we hear about because we do say in, in the book, there's a section, in each book, there's a section saying, please fill out our adoption form if you are using. Um, but whether people actually do that or not is is yeah. another question. So yeah. that's good that you include that. Or um, yeah. in our local program, we're going to start doing that just to kind of yeah. It looks like Jenny Parker from Clark University has a question. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I One comment and one question. I just wanted to say that um, I recently was putting together a list of um, different subjects, uh, OER books to kind of refer our faculty to. And I came across your series and was pleasantly surprised at, you know, the the number uh, and diversity of, you know, topics for the book. So, um, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you over Zoom. Pleasure um, to meet you too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just kind of a question I had. I mean, it's, um, like you said, pretty amazing. You started out um, going for one book and ended up with, with several. Um, and I'm just thinking about, uh, I don't know that we've had any um, OER adoptions in our philosophy department, but say there was a, an intro to philosophy course might you recommend, you know, a chapter or two or three, you know, from each of those mm -hmm. books as kind of a broad overview? Or I just kind of wondered what your thoughts might be on that. That's an excellent question. You know, sort of going back to the one book out of out of the six so far, right? Like thinking about, okay, if, if you wanted to start putting together something for your course, which chapters might you use? And I think that's it's an excellent question, and I'm I'm afraid my answer is going to be it's, it depends. I suppose. Yeah. So, I bet. um, the the reason why I have not um uh, done a ton of teaching kind of broad intro to philosophy courses is just because here at EBC our introduction to philosophy uh, are broken up into two courses, and one is more value theory, ethics, social and political aesthetics, and one is more metaphysics, epistemology, um philosophy of science and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and I've just taught the value theory one. And so it's, you know, in, in my case, if I were to, to use um, these books for my course, which strangely I haven't because just the way that I teach philosophy is slightly different. Um, but I would, I would pick and choose, you know, the topics that are specific to my particular course, whereas someone who's doing a full course, um, may want to say, okay, well, I'm interested in this chapter about epistemology and this chapter about epistemology. And then for ethics, I'm interested in these three, but not those, right? So I, I think it's really going to depend on on how the course is taught and, and what they're specifically looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Just philosophy is kind of like that. It's it's not, I don't know, I talked to, to colleagues in, in some other um, disciplines and and, you know, they'll have a single course and it always covers, you know, the same thing. And philosophy is like, well, you could talk about this or that, and, <laughs> you know, as an intro, it's um, it just differs a lot. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm not yeah. a ton of help on that one. No, no, that's <laughs> that's helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. I did also just quickly open the adoption form and there's over 80 entries in the adoption form. So that's not too bad. And these are for different books. They're not all for the the same books there. 
Yeah. Although I have to say most of them are the ethics book. That one seems to be the most popular for some reason. It's a good one. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. <laughs> That is, that's quite a, that's a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. It's quite a yeah. robust adoption number. Um, I have a quick question sort of about peer review. So it's great to see that peer review is really like baked into all steps of the process. You know, like we, I mean, just in working with our local authors, a lot of times peer review is sort of an afterthought um, and our authors don't really plan for that often, like from the very beginning. And so it sounds like, you know, you really made good use of the Rebus community for a lot of this stuff. Did you also find your peer reviewers through the Rebus community as well? Some of them, yes. So um, they're on the Rebus community website. There's, uh, I, I linked to our, our own project page, but there's also a number of other pages on their website. And one of them is a contributor marketplace, I think it's called. Um, where people can post calls for contributors for various things. So um, there are a number of people who are on that um, uh, website forum. Thank you. Excellent, Abby. Uh, she's doing so great with the links. Um, and they, if they are not the right people, many of them are connected to other folks in their institutions who can can share that information out. Rebus community also does a, a newsletter, a frequent newsletter, where, where they will include links for the current calls for uh, participation. Um, mostly we have gotten them through uh, philosophy email lists, I would say. So we just do a blast out saying, here's a link to the, um, not the book, because it's not, you know, ready for sharing, obviously, but here's a link to the chapter outline, you know, here's the um, editor, here's the review guide. Is there anybody who might be interested in doing a peer review? And we, at first we were asking for folks to have a PhD in philosophy and then, and then that didn't, you know, we decided that wasn't required anymore because we had some undergraduate students who were interested and I thought, oh, that's fantastic. We should also have the opportunity for the audience of the book, even though they were tended to be um, upper level undergraduate, um, we should have the opportunity for students to do a review as well. So we did try to also have faculty members um, who either or advanced graduate students uh, and uh, as well as as the undergraduates, um, and it tended to be through philosophy email lists. Occasionally, it was um, you know just people that uh, one of us working on the book would happen to know. <laughs> oh, I think so and so would be a good uh, peer reviewer. But yeah, what a great way to involve undergrads to give them something to put on their CV if they're graduating. Yeah, that came through one of the book editors who said, oh, I've got a couple of students who would be really interested in participating. And it wasn't in that book. I think it was they just wanted to participate in the project generally. And so I said, well, here's the books we have available to peer review. Yeah, we should have to say that more because I think that only happened once. We should do more of that. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Well, I, get those. I also have links to all of our guides. They are in the slide notes. Um, if anybody's interested in, you know, here are the guides that we put together. But the Rebus Community Guide um, to Publishing Open Textbooks uh, has a bunch of um, templates for guides uh, and workflows that are just fantastic. But if anybody wants to see the ones we use specifically for these books, the, the links are in the, the slides that I shared um with the group nice yeah 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 i think any sort of like guides that are very practically oriented that include workflows and things are just yeah we can't get enough of those <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the one um the one for importing and formatting and press books is particularly long and involved um just because we we found a number of things that that needed to be done in a particular way in order for them to show up right yeah. <laughs> in press books. And it's not just press books, you know, it's, you would have to do this with any publishing yeah. platform, right? So yeah. I do have a link to that one as well. They all have their quirks. <laughs> mm -hmm. All of them. Yeah. yeah. I have to say press books has been really great. I've, I do really 
appreciate working in it. And maybe that's because I have a lot of experience with WordPress mm -hmm. just from previous things that I've done. Um, so it felt pretty easy, but I also appreciated um, the ability to do uh, accessibility um, well in Pressbooks, particularly for the logic book where we had a lot of um, formulas and um, there was a, a really, I wouldn't say easy, but relatively straightforward way to make sure that those um, were accessible. I also really like their uh, glossary um, functionality because we do have a glossary for each of the chapters as well. And you can you know hover over the word, but you can also see it all in one list, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Pressbooks is great. It, yeah, it seems to be like just very well optimized for a tech-based OER and yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Hendricks. I think, you know, we sure. all learned quite a bit from this and we really appreciate your time and coming to speak with us. Um, for those of you in the audience who'd like to share this video with your colleagues or just watch it again at some point, um, the YouTube video will be available on Iowa OER YouTube probably by the end of the day or early tomorrow. And um, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Happy to share. <laughs> All right. Take care. Great. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.